and let me pull up our first slide. So welcome everybody to the CSLP 2020 Imagine Your Story webinar. And this webinar is for all four age groups, early literacy, children, teen, and adults. So really it's for everybody. And who am I? My name's Beth Yates, as I mentioned earlier. I'm the children's consultant here at the Indiana State Library. I work in our professional development office and I provide professional development training opportunities like this to youth services librarians across the state um, in addition to providing best practices and support to youth services librarians also. My email address is right there. It's B as in Beth, <laughs> Y-A-T-E-S at library.in.gov. That is the best way to get a hold of me. And the thing that you should know uh, about me for this webinar is that I am actually the Indiana State Representative for the Collaborative Summer Library Program. So what that means is I'm kind of your go-to person, your point person here in the state of Indiana. So if you have any questions about the Collaborative Summer Library Program or really about summer reading in general, you should feel free to contact me. Um, okay. So that's who I am. Now I do want to know who you guys are and you've all been introducing yourselves, but what I really want to know is, let me make this larger and open it up, um, which area of the library do you work in? Um, just pick the one that matches you the closest. I know that a lot of us do. We wear lots of different hats. So let's see, oh, lots of children's reference. which is pretty typical, but also lots of combos. And we do have some teen and adult, so that's always exciting. I'm gonna, there we go. I don't think I was broadcasting the results, but hopefully you guys can all see them now. Yeah, so by far and large, it looks like most of our folks are youth services or they kind of do everything. I'm really thrilled to see there's several admin, CERC, IT, collection development, kind of other category. That's always great to have those folks participating too. And uh, some teen and adult as well. So that's always great. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and end this poll because I think we have a good overview and we will continue on. Minimize this. Okay. So, thanks for that, you guys. It's good to know kind of the mix of folks that we have here. Um, so the objective for this webinar is kind of twofold. The first is that I want to introduce you guys to some of the aspects of the 2020 program including some updates and some news. Um, and then the second goal for this training is to give you guys some resources for program planning, as well as, as well as a couple of program ideas so that whenever you are ready to start planning, whether that is tomorrow or in May, um, you will hopefully have some somewhere to jump off from, somewhere to start from. You don't have to start from scratch. So the agenda for this webinar is I'm going to start with the updates. I will move on to resources. I will share some program ideas, some of my kind of top um, kind of um, the ones that stood out to me that I've heard. And then at the end, I'm going to give you guys a few minutes to share your ideas. Um, and I will be collecting all of those program ideas and adding them to what I call my program idea sheet. Um, and I'll explain more about that program idea sheet in just a few minutes. But first, I would like to take this opportunity to explain a little bit more about what CSLP is and how it works. Um, it's something that when I worked in a public library, which I did for 12 years, and we used CSLP there, I was aware of the program because we used it. I knew that it was something that lots of libraries could use but I didn't really know where exactly it came from or how it was developed. So I like to share that info with you because I think it's interesting and it is important to understand. So Collaborative Summer Library Program is just that. It is a collaborative. Um, it is 
representatives from 50 states plus several U.S. territories, and I think we've expanded even beyond that. Uh, I think we have some non-U.S. Uh, members now too, which is awesome. And um, so those state representatives are usually people like me at a state library. And then we also have a big component of public librarians who also contribute um, to the program development. And just like any good library organization, we work by committee. So there's a bunch of different committees. There's a manual committee, an art committee, a vendor committee, an inclusion committee, et cetera, et cetera, so many different committees. And um, so it's volunteers who, uh, who are working from public libraries like you guys, who work at state libraries like me, who put together these programs, who create the manuals, who work with the artists on the artwork, who decide what's gonna be at least to some extent in the vendor catalogs, so uh, incentive catalogs. So I think it's really good to know that, and in some ways it's amazing what we can pull together, being such a large organization and, and completely made up of volunteers. There's only two paid employees of CSLP, that's an administrative assistant, and the organizational coordinator who kind of does the legwork of the committees and the board. Um, but yeah, so, if you were surprised to learn that that is how we work, feel free to comment in the chat. Um, or, uh, yeah, if you're interested in participating as a volunteer in the future, um, this fall, uh, fall, probably August, September-ish, I will put a call out on the listservs for people who are interested in volunteering, and you can, you can volunteer at that time. Because um, we'd love to have you. All right. So let's talk about the program itself. So the 2020 slogan, as I'm sure you're all aware, it was in the title of this webinar, it's Imagine Your Story. And the way that the program, how we develop slogans, is that first we come up with themes. And we, we solicit these themes from our states. So I usually send out some sort of survey and I ask you guys to let me know what are some of your top choices. Um, and so folktales, fairy tales, and mythology was the one that was selected for 2020. And then once we have that selected, then we come up with the slogan. Um, once we come up with the slogan, though, it's really up to your individual library to interpret that, what that means to you. So you can, of course, use the official one. Again, folktales, fairy tales, and mythology. That is certainly what a lot of the manual is centered around. But you can also do, how, do whatever you want to, um, however your library wants to interpret it. So you could even just do stories in all forms, since it's imagine your story. So that could be telling your story, telling your community story, telling your family's story. Um, it's modes of storytelling, like film, um, television, of course, books and writing, um, podcasting. It's really anything, any sort of form of storytelling you could pull into this. If you are thinking of doing something other than folk tales, fairy tales, mythology, or stories, comment in the chat box and let us know what else you're thinking of doing. Okay, so let's go over a few of the updates, some of the news from the program. The first one is the artwork. And uh, just an FYI, the artists this year, I don't think we promote our artists enough, so I want to make sure that I am letting you know who the artist is this year. Her name is Lee Wen Pham. And you children's librarians in particular will probably recognize her work. She wrote and illustrated Big Sister, Little Sister, but she also has done the art for Princess in Black and Alvin Ho. That's Freckle Face Strawberry and a ton of other books. So she um, she's pretty prolific when it comes to doing art, so I'm sure some of you will recognize her, her artwork. Now, we did have a couple of glitches this year with the program, and one of them was a pretty major glitch. Um, Lee Wen did her research, and she tried to um, find story tales, folk tales, fairy tales from all different cultures. But unfortunately, what um, we didn't realize, and this artwork went through, you know, I mentioned the art committee, it went through the art committee, it went through the inclusion committee, it was actually viewed by all of the state representatives, 
And because we did not have any representation from the indigenous peoples of the Pacific Northwest on any of those committees or as any state reps, we did not realize that some of the imagery used in the posters and, and um, some of the incentives, um, unfortunately, are very sacred to the indigenous people of the Pacific Northwest, some of those peoples. Um, in particular, the images of the raven and coyote being spire uh, were very sacred stories to those peoples. And um, using them, the issue is not so much that we use them, but that we use them juxtaposed next to fairy tales. So um, the one thing, the way we can kind of compare it is if, for instance, we had used um, Bible characters next to uh, Little Red Riding Hood. If you happen to be someone of the Christian faith, you might find issue or, or find that to be offensive or just inappropriate, right? So similarly, these images of the Raven and Coyote Rings Fire, it was just inappropriate that they were used next to the fairy tale characters. Um, that was kind of the big thing. So, um, so we wanted to be respectful of those peoples, and so we uh, pulled, the organization pulled the posters and any other uh, items that contain those images. Um, it is disappointing. I loved these posters. I thought they were beautiful, um, and, and so it's unfortunate, but, um, but it did need to be done, and we totally understand that. So we're going to make the best of it. And uh, there's a couple of things to keep in mind. First of all, well, first of all, there is a list of images that are no longer recommended for you to use and uh, because they are still on your flash drives. Um, and so at the end of this training, I have that list that you can download and refer to if you want to. Um, because of time constraints and also money, it would be quite expensive to redesign and reprint a bunch of posters for purchase. Um, pro, it was cost prohibitive, really, for the organization. They were able to come up with one substitute poster that is available for purchase if you're interested in it on the online store. Um, they pulled the children that are in the bottom left-hand corner of the children's poster there, and they, um, they were able to make a simple poster out of that. You know, it might not be your cup of tea. I totally get it. Um, and so I, I actually spoke to CSLP and said, could we accept, um, if, a, if a public library has a uh, graphic designer on staff and they are creating their own poster um, anyway, and they're using just CSLP clip art, um, they're not using any other licensed um, software or artwork, um, and they are willing to share it for other libraries to use, could we post that on our online only section? And CSLP said, sure. So we have one up there for sure already from Indiana. Jasper County in Northwest Indiana was very kind to submit their um, poster that they designed using some of the clip art. And this is in the online only section of the website and I will show you how to get to that. So that's one option you could download and print if you wanted to. Um, the other option is that the Library of Michigan, so the equivalent of the Indiana State Library, but in Michigan, has a graphic designer on staff, and they actually edited the original posters to remove those questionable images, and they have provided those for people to download and print also, and they provide a few different formats, including one that you could send to a professional printer if you wanted them to officially print them. Um, if you don't have that capability in your library to print like a poster sized um, something. So um, those are linked from what I like to call my program idea sheet. They are not on the CSLP website, but they are on that program idea sheet that I am going to have. So you will have access to those also if you want to look at those. Do we have any questions about artwork before I move on to talk about the manual? You can type those in the chat box if you do. See one person typing. Will there still be clip art options on the flash drive we receive? Yes, cat. Um, so you should actually already have your flash drives 
as well as you can access it on the manual. And there are still quite a few clip art options. It's, it was just those few that had to be removed. Um, and in fact, the flash drives still contain all of the artwork because, um, well, because they were produced before we realized there was an issue. So that's why at the end, there will be that list of images that we suggest you not use, ideally. Um, it is really up to each individual library to decide whether or not they want to use those images. And, and CSLP is just recommending that you not use them. Um, so that's really kind of the, the deal with that. Okay, so let's talk about the manual. It has been revised this year, and we hope that uh, you will think it's for the best. <laughs> Um, I certainly think it's a vast improvement. This is kind of an overall view of a page. Um, the first thing you might notice is that it is almost a full page wide. So instead of that two column black and white manual, it is now a full page, um, in fact it's in color manual, and then there's just a sidebar over on the right hand side. Yes, Kat, I think it's, I do think it's a much more engaging and easy to read too. Um, and the other thing they did is, if you look at it, um, the early literacy section is still separate. They have kept that on its own. It's still separated into babies, toddlers, and preschoolers. And then there's ideas for talking, singing, reading, writing, and playing during story time based on the summer reading theme um, for those different age groups in that section. Of course, talking, singing, reading, writing, and playing is the every child ready to read practices, right? Um, but so that is still pretty much the same as it has been. The children, teen, and adults, however, is different. So instead of having a separate manual for each age group, they've actually combined them into one. And then they've put these tabs at the top to indicate um, what ages a program could be used for. Um, so this program could be used for all ages. You will also find some that are just teen and adults, some that are just adults, some that are just children. Um, so it still has some that are one age only. But the reason why they did this is because they found that, first of all, a lot of programs could be done for multiple age groups um, or for families or all ages. So they, you know, there was no real good way to do that before. So that's one reason. The other is that a lot of libraries are doing multi-generational programming. So it's nice to see them all together for that reason also. I'm going to zoom in here a little bit. So you can see a little closer. So this fairy tale ball is for children for plus or multi-generational, but there are adaptations for teens or adults. Those are on the right-hand side. So this is, for instance, an adaptation for adults would be that you could throw a masquerade ball or a murder mystery party if you didn't want to do fairy tales. Although certainly I think a lot of adults would probably enjoy a fairy tale ball too. And then it just goes down through the whole program and it gives you all of the materials that you need and instructions for doing that program. Now, if you are someone who prefers to only see an individual uh, age group, you don't want everything combined, you can still access that so this is uh, if you put the flash drive in, but it's the same thing online. You can see 04 is programming manual. And if you click on that, it opens up all of the options. So you can still download by chapter. You can still download the full manual. But at the top, you can actually see that you can download it by age group still. So if you only want the teen program ideas, you can go and uh, just download the teen program ideas. Okay, so I mentioned that, um, that that I had already sent out the flash drives. I sent these out to directors back in October, and um, so hopefully they should have those by now. Hopefully they distributed them to those of you who are in charge of summer reading at your library. Um, if you have not seen the flash drive yourself, Check with your coworkers, see if somebody grabbed it, check with your director, make sure it's not on their desk. If you absolutely can't find it, then feel free to contact me and I will send you out a new one. Um, but that being said, we did have, this is the second glitch for this year, hopefully the last glitch for this year too, but the second glitch was we discovered that some of the flash drives had not been properly formatted by the company that provided them to CSLP. 
So some of you were opening your flash drives and finding that you couldn't open particular files mm -hmm. or maybe you didn't see anything on your flash drive. Um, if that is you, if you already let me know, I did just last week send out new replacement flash drives. We were able to get replacements for free from that company, um, thank goodness. Um, but if you have not looked at your flash drive yet, please make sure you do ASAP and then contact me and let me know and I will send you out a new one. Um, definitely coordinate with your colleagues and make sure only one person from your library contacts me just so I don't get confused. Um, and, uh, okay, Megan, so make sure you send me an email. Um, I'll put my email address in here again and it will be up at the end. And I will get one out to your library. But that being said, you actually don't need the flash drive to access the information because everything is available online. And I'd like to really encourage you all to try this out this year. Um, if you've never logged in before, I'm going to quickly walk you through, but please be aware that at the end of this webinar, I will also be providing you with uh, downloadable instructions for accessing the website too. Um, so you don't have to memorize this. This is just in case you're a visual learner, okay? Um, so you go to the CSLP website. Top right corner, you have to log in. If you've never logged in before, you'll need to create an account just like any other website account. Um, it will ask what state you're in. Um, just a heads up that all Indiana libraries are members of CSLP whether or not you use the program um, because the state library pays your membership fee every year. It's not a huge membership fee, but we do like to take care of that for you so that everybody has access to, this, uh, to these materials. So you will go up and you will log in. Um, if you have never logged in before, you do have to create an account like I said, but if you have logged in before, even if you um, even if you had an account previously, if you did not log in before the end of 2019, you might need to recreate an account because they wiped the servers and they were starting fresh. Um, so that's a possibility, so don't be alarmed. But at any rate, you will log in. Um, individuals at a library can have their own login. You don't have to just have one per library. Multiple people can do it, it's fine. Um, once you've logged in, you will go to manual downloads along the top and then the first time you log into the manual this year you will need to get an online access code. Now this is a thing that only one person per library should get. You can share it with your colleagues but coordinate with your coworkers and um, just have one of you grab this code and then once you get the code share it with your coworkers you can still log in on your individual login and use that code. You should be able to. Um, so once you have the code, then you can go to the 2020 online manual. This is what it looks like. I have cut off at the top. There's a banner, a big picture. Um, but this is generally what it looks like. And there's several different ways you can access the information. On the top left there, you can see the full program manual downloads. Um, and then, let's see, right there, you can see the artwork and program files, and this is where they're kind of individually listed. This is where you'll find the artwork. And on the bottom right is where you can narrow your search results. So if you just want the art, you can search for just the art. The other thing you can do is search for just the online only materials. And I apologize, I think this picture looks a little bit blurry but it says online only materials and there's a box that you can select there and that is where you will find, for instance, that uh, poster that Jasper County submitted so you can download that from here. So the other reason why I really, really encourage you to access um, the manual online if, if you are so inclined is because next year it's pretty unlikely that we will be purchasing flash drives. Um, the online manual has everything that you need, um, plus all that extra online only stuff. It's getting easier to use every year. And I think that most libraries are, um, they have fast enough internet at this point where it shouldn't be a problem to have to download things. 
if you are one of those libraries, rest assured that I will still order some flash drives, you know, a couple flash drives. So if you're having trouble, you can let me know and I can send you a physical flash drive. But otherwise, please plan on probably having to access the manuals online next year. Um, and um, the other benefit is that anybody can just log into their computer and access the manual whenever they want it, right? You don't have to wait for your coworker to pass you that flash drive in order to get to it. So, <clears throat> so that is, um, there's lots of benefits to it too. Any questions or concerns about that before we go on to the next thing? All right, I don't see anybody typing yet, but if you come up with a question, just let me know. <clears throat> oh, just a quick reminder that you can get to the incentive store from the CSLP website. Also, there is a tab along the top that says shop, so you just select that. I think you do have to be logged in to access it, but that is how you get to it. Um, you might encounter some things that say that they are out of stock, um, but those are usually updated as soon as more things are able to be ordered. They just, um, they post that because, um, you know, they don't want to sell more than they have in the warehouse and um, they have to make sure that it can be reordered because sometimes things are discontinued suddenly without any advance notice, right? So in order to make sure they can still get more, they have to double check that. And then once they do and they order more, they post it to the website. Okay, so we're going to move on to resources again, unless we have any other questions about some of those updates. And don't see anybody typing, so we're going to keep going. Okay, so let's talk about some resources you can use for program planning. So the first thing I want you to know, and possibly the most important thing, is about my program idea sheet. I've alluded to this a few times so far in this training, and this is what it is. It is literally a document. It's posted on the ISL website, and I will be providing you with a, you can actually download it today uh, at the end of the webinar, and when you go to the, or uh, when you download that document, it gives you information on how to access it on the website too. So you can always get to the live, most updated version of it. But here's what it is. Um, as I have been traveling around the state, I have been collecting program ideas from librarians, just like you guys, and I have been adding them to this program idea sheet. Um, so it does start out at the top with some resources. All the resources I'm gonna talk about here in just a second are linked to from this program idea sheet. So you don't have to write down all of those uh, web addresses, all those links, because you can just go to this program idea sheet and, and go to them from there. Um, and also, just a side note, the artwork from Michigan that they have edited, the original posters, you can access those from here too. Um, so that's at the top, the, all those resources are at the top, and then as you scroll down, you'll come across the program ideas themselves. They are divided by age group, so it's all ages, preschool, uh, school age, teen, and adult. And then within that, they're not really in any particular order. It's more of a browsing list. Um, it's there to kind of spark ideas. Some of them are full program ideas. Some of them are just single activity ideas. But um, you can also search if you have a particular thing that you are interested in by hitting Control F. You can see where it says all ages program ideas, then under that I put a little reminder for how to search. Um, and so there's all kinds of program ideas here. Most of them are related to folk tales, fairy tales, and mythology, or telling your story, or storytelling modes, um, like again, filmmaking, writing, things like that. There are some things that are not at all related to imagine your story though. Um, it's my personal philosophy that you do not have to, it's better, I should say, it's better to program um, with ideas that your patrons will like and want to come to than it is to try to shoehorn in the summer reading theme um, into all of your programs this summer. So don't feel tied down to that. 
But that being said, there's plenty of ideas that are related to it also if you're interested in doing that. So again, this will be available for download at the end and the download includes instructions for getting to it on the website. <clears throat> okay, so one of the resources that are included, that is included on that sheet is Pinterest. Um, the State Library has the Pinterest page and I have started a board centered around Imagine Your Story. But likewise, the Collaborative Summer Library Program has their own Pinterest page and they actually have boards dedicated to each individual age group. So check out both of those, um, full of great ideas. The National Storytelling Network is a partner of CSLP this summer um, because storytelling is a natural fit with Imagine Your Story, right? Um, storytelling is, in case you're not totally clear on what storytelling is, it's when someone stands up in front of a group and they're telling a story kind of in the oral tradition. Um, <clears throat> so there are lots of people out there you can hire to do it, but if you want to try your hand at it or you're a storyteller yourself, um, on both the flash drive and the website, they have provided these um, documents that include, so there you can see these are the chapters of the manual, and then if you open one of them up, this is the theme Once Upon a Time, which is one of those manual chapters, and then it gives you suggested stories along with their suggested audience age and ideas for telling the story and then resources for where you can find the story. So if you want to try your hand at storytelling, this does exist for you to kind of, again, have a jumping off place. Now, Indiana has a storytelling guild, and you can access that at Storytelling Arts of Indiana. They have a hire a storyteller link in the top right corner of their website. But um, also, again, if you want to try your hand or if you want to encourage kids or adults to try storytelling, they have teacher's guides on their website also that is under the reviews and resources that can kind of step you, step you through, walk you through um, how to do that. <clears throat> um, the Indiana Young Reader Center is part of the State Library. It's actually where we house all of our Indiana author and illustrator books for youth. And the librarian there is Suzanne Walker. Um, she used to be in my position a number of years ago, so probably a lot of you know that name. Um, but she's now the librarian for the Indiana Young Reader Center, and she created, <clears throat> excuse me, she created this guide that kind of marries some of the initiatives of the State Library with Imagine Your Story. So for instance, genealogy is a big part of what the State Library does. We have a wonderful collection of genealogy books. Um, and a wonderful genealogy department. And so she came up with a Tell Your Own Family Story program. Um, and one of the activities is making a personal family tree craft. So this guide is downloadable, again, from the program idea sheet. Um, another organization that we worked with was the Nature Conservancy. They came up with a guide with five different activity ideas that married both nature and imagine your story. So it's encouraging kids to talk about nature, to get outside, to be active. Um, so you, you can see there's a few different things there on the right under the table of contents. Activity, activity number five is be a little landowner. How will you care for the land? And this is a program that's centered around the Children of Indiana Nature Park. Now, if you're not familiar with that park, it is a real physical park in kind of East Central Indiana, and it's meant to be owned by all of the children of Indiana. There are supposed to be enough parcels of land that each uh, child in Indiana can claim one so that they can own a small little piece of that park. And you can actually print off um, deeds to those parcels of land with the kids' names on them from the website. So this program kind of walks you through how you might do a program centered around that activity. And this is also downloadable from the program idea sheet. Um, this is just a quick reminder, PSA, that so we do have a list of Indiana performers and presenters on the State Library website. Um, it is divided by type of performer and 
and then it's really just the name of the performer and then a link to their website. Um, it would unfortunately be too time consuming for me to try to keep this up with any more information than that. So we do depend on them to provide us, or not provide us, but to have a, an up-to-date website. Um, so you can go to their website to learn more about them. These are people who are recommended by Indiana Library workers who have seen them perform and say that they are A-OK -okay and suggest them for library performances. Uh, so you know, I don't accept solicitations from the performers themselves, just FYI. So. Um, that is linked to from the program idea sheet. And then finally, just a reminder, if you used it last year, you might be familiar with this already, but StarNet has a STEM activity clearinghouse that is full of complete program plans. Um, they are all, of course, STEM related, and often they are space centric, but not everything in here is space. They also have some earth science, they have some coding, um, they have some other stuff. Uh, it's a great one-stop shop, a go-to place to find program ideas. All right, any questions about some of those resources before we delve into program ideas themselves? I'm going to pause for just a second, get a drink of water, and see if anybody has any questions. Somebody typing? Maybe? All right. Well, I'm going to continue on with those program ideas, but if you do come up with a question, type it in that chat box for me. Okay. So let's start with a couple of preschool ideas. And I should note that these are, you know, not exhaustive. There are so many more program ideas on the program idea sheet and in your manual. These are just a few that stood out to me as being kind of cool that I wanted to highlight for you, okay? So, preschool. First of all, this is not a complete program idea, of course, but it is certainly an activity you could do in a number of different programs for preschoolers. You can do a fairy dust sensory writing tray. So this is literally just salt and food coloring that are mixed together to create kind of light colored, you know, pastelish sort of salt, and then you can bury fairy related things in there, or um, you can make it a writing tray like they have in this picture. Um, of course, I've heard lots of people wanting to do a princess party or a royal party. I like royal party because it could, it's very welcoming and inclusive of both boys and girls. Um, but, you know, whatever you want to do is, you know, your, your choice. You could also do, I've heard of like a princess breakfast, and that's, um, some libraries have had their local high school students, they get volunteers to, you know, they rent the costumes and have the girls dress up as some of the Disney princesses, kind of like at Disney World where you can go to a princess breakfast. Similar concept. And then they do a party at their library with, the, with, those, with those girls dressed up. Um, and then, of course, tea parties are always fun. Fancy Nancy tea party, princess or royalty tea party, uh, high tea party could be another one. Um, so that's just a couple of princess party ideas. Um, don't forget all those awesome fairy tales. A lot of kids don't know fairy tales because I feel like they're not told as often as they used to be. But you can introduce those fairy tales to them. Here's one idea. Oh, yeah. Kat says they're popular. Tea parties are popular with older ladies, too. Yeah, absolutely. You're totally right. Um, and this is a Hansel and Gretel candy house. Um, this is made with uh, graham crackers instead of worrying about gingerbread, um, which would probably be more difficult to get this in the summer um, than in the winter. Um, so just use graham crackers. It's also more affordable, probably. And then let them go crazy decorating with candy. I like these story boxes. This would definitely potentially be a family program or an upper uh, preschool age program. But it's creating a story box using a shoe box. And you cut one side of the shoe box so that it will kind of fold down like a flap and then you essentially create a diorama in there 
Um, this one's just a simple forest, but they've made it Little Red Riding Hood by using these little dolls. Um, you don't have to use actual dolls or finger puppets. You could easily use paper dolls, paper cutouts, to kind of reenact, make a little, um, a little scene in your story box. And then the best part is it folds up, you put the lid on it, and you can transport it easily. Um, story stones are a nice idea you can do with lots of different ages and groups. Um, but again, if you're wanting to tell a lot of fairy tales, folk tales um, this, this summer, you could try with the younger kids to make the story stones. So this one you can either draw on them if you have older kids, or you can cut the images out and let them mod podge or glue them onto the stones. And then as you tell a story, um, or they help you retell the story, you can use these story tones to set things out. Oh, a cat says decorated clothespins. Are you talking about like those wooden clothespins, cat? And then you decorate them like little, oh yeah, like little people. Awesome, great idea. Let's talk about a couple of elementary age ideas. Um, I really love this one. I got this one from the thelegolibrarian.com. Um, and this is a hero training camp, kind of centered around Greek and Roman myths. And this one had tests of speed, agility, and teamwork. So for instance, for the agility, they were throwing pool noodles through a hoop. Um, for teamwork, um, one of the children was blindfolded and another child had to navigate them through a maze that was on the floor. Rick Riordan is, of course, an excellent uh, source material for this summer since he has um, the Greek myths, um, he's got the Egyptian myths, he's got the Norse myths. Um, so you could certainly do a whole series of programs for kids centered around those books. Um, I know my kids are still into them, so I think they are still pretty popular. Cardboard box castle building challenge. So grab some uh, donated or collected cardboard. You can talk to local grocery stores, furniture stores, Collect all the cardboard that you can, and then let the kids go crazy building things. Castles are just one example of things that they could build, of course. And then fairy tale stem is another great idea. I've heard a lot of people talking about wanting to do these. This particular example in the picture is the uh, three little pigs, and they the kids would build houses out of various random materials. This one, of course, you can probably kind of see is made of toothpicks and gumdrops, but I've also heard of using popsicle sticks and um, just all kinds of other uh, materials. And the goal is to build something that cannot be knocked over by a hairdryer. And this one, they actually even put the big bad wolf mask on the hairdryer to symbolize that he's blowing it over. So. Um, so there's actually quite a few different ideas for this. There are some ideas in the manual, so check that out. And then if you're so inclined, I have heard that the website Teachers Pay Teachers, um, you do have to pay a small fee for it, but that they have a whole series of these fairy tale STEM programs. So if you're really into it and you're willing to pay a couple dollars for it, check that out. But check out the manual first because that is free. Um, let's talk a couple of teen and adult ideas. I did combine them because I was I was going to separate them, and then I was like, you know what? I feel like all of these programs could easily be done, be done for either age group. So um, if you guys are familiar with this show on Netflix called Nailed It, um, it's a decorating, like a cake and cupcake cookie decorating TV show where they present them with this beautifully decorated, elaborately decorated um, cake, cookie, whatever, and then the contestants have to recreate it. And in that, the funny part is that the contestants have no baking skills at all. Um, but if you do it at the library, you could ask a bakery to create something kind of elaborately decorated for you if you're not crafty yourself in that way, and then have them try it, you know, you provide the 
cupcakes, you provide the um, materials for decorating and then have them attempt to recreate it. Um, it could be a contest or just for fun. And you can make it themed if you want to. So you can see here, um, like they had a Harry Potter thing. There's um, a moon, which could be like nursery rhyme sort of. Yeah, cat. Local cafes or pastry shops might, uh, might definitely help with that. And when you're sourcing cupcakes, if you don't want to bake them all yourself, um, we, at my old library, we actually talked to the local grocery store, I think it was Kroger or Target, and we negotiated with them for a discounted rate for a large number of cupcakes because we said it's the library um, and they were willing to help us out. So definitely investigate those sorts of relationships. Now, I have to say Harry Potter is not exactly a fit with folktales, fairy tales, and mythology, but it's definitely wizards related to magic and, and, and folktales and fairy tales are related to magic. So a lot of libraries are talking about Harry Potter programs this summer, which is always fun and popular, even, even now, however long it's been since the books uh, and movies had been released. And several libraries have talked about doing wizard's balls. So throwing a party for the teens or even the adults that is Harry Potter centric and after hours is even better if you can swing that. Um, I think for teens and adults exploring different formats for storytelling, this is a great opportunity to do so. So try some stop motion programs. Um, there's apps you can download to your phone for that. Also, even just flip books is a place to start if you don't want to go as quote unquote high tech as stop motion, you can start with flip books because it teaches a similar concept um, of kind of like cartooning and how that sort of animation would happen. Similarly, any sort of um, filmmaking, video making, green screen, um, writing programs, podcasting programs, um, uh, music programs, because music and, store and uh, songwriting is also telling a story, right? So anything like that could easily fit in this summer. Um, kind of related to that is cosplay, LARPing, um, doing some sort of comic con at your library, but just encouraging people to dress up, talk about, uh, you know, share the things that they love, um, share their stories of the things that they appreciate and, uh, and are fans of. And by the way, if your library is not big enough to do a comic con on your own, think about asking your neighboring libraries if they would be interested in going in on you or in with you um, to throw one of these. And then you could attract patrons from, you know, across your county or across a couple counties. Um, this is also a great sum summer for storytelling games or role playing games. Um, this picture that I have up here is of a group called Critical Role. And they do Dungeons and Dragons, um, which is really just making up your own story. Um, you have a, the dungeon master who is leading the story, but then really the, the members of the, the group are telling a story um, that they're making up as they go. So it's a wonderful opportunity to practice those storytelling skills, especially for teens. Um, and I put Critical Role up here because they're kind of like, the highest end. They're like what you can aspire to be. But if you've never experienced uh, watching somebody play a role playing game or D&D, &D, um, you can check out their YouTube channel and you can watch kind of masters at work. You can see a really wonderful example of what it can become. Um, they also have resources on their channel for how to get started and how to do your own. So you can check that out. Yes, Diane, absolutely. Writing your own memoir. And journaling is another wonderful one to encourage, especially teens. Um, getting them started in writing their own journals and diaries can be a great exercise in writing and storytelling. Um, trivia is always fun and popular, especially if you do it, you know, you could do it in the library, um, but consider doing it outside the library at a local restaurant or bar or you know, brewery, whatever you've got in your community, um, if somebody's willing to partner. Um, sometimes people are more willing to come to something like that if it's at a local, a local shop as opposed to the library. You might attract a new group of people. And you can either write your own questions or you can often find them on the, on, uh, you know, the internet. 
All right, and just a couple more program ideas, some all ages family ideas. Um, family show and tell or family storytelling. So again, um, encouraging people to tell their own story, write their story, perform their story. Picking the show and tell one is encouraging families to pick a family heirloom and then to come in and talk about it or to maybe write about it, share that story. Um, behind the music with local musicians. So if you remember that VH1 show, Behind the Music, if you're old enough to remember that, like I am, um, you could invite a local musician in and basically they play their songs and then they tell the story of how they wrote the song or what the inspiration for the song was. Uh, Jennifer says they are going to do a camp where they're going to play D&D, serve lunch, do crafts. That sounds amazing. Yeah, so I should say if you want to try D&D, &D, you can also try contacting your, if you have any like game stores in your area, they might know people who could get you started or be willing to volunteer. Um, and similarly, you might have some folks on your staff that you didn't even realize were into this who do this regularly who might be willing to step up and uh, lead a group or teach you how to do it too. So definitely check that out. Okay, and my last program idea is doing some sort of fairy tale film festival or an interactive movie night. Um, both of these would require, you know, you have to make sure you have the right licenses to show movies in a, in a public venue to multiple people. Um, so talk to your directors about that. But otherwise, if you pick a series of fairy tale film, fairy tale centric films this summer, you could do a whole series of them. Interactive movies are when, you know, think like Rocky Horror Picture Show. So when something's happening on screen, the audience is doing something to correspond with that. So um, if it's snowing, maybe everybody throws popcorn at the screen or um, maybe everybody shouts out something whenever a certain character comes on screen. And you can um, Google uh, interactive movies and you will come up with some suggestions for that. Ooh, Princess Bride might be a great choice. Yeah, sure. All right, so like I said, that is just a small taste of ideas. These and a ton more ideas are all on that program idea sheet that I have been talking about incessantly. And of course, in your manual. So make sure you check out your manual. So right now, I want to give you guys an opportunity to share some program ideas. So I'm going to encourage you to... Type any program ideas you have into this box that I've put in the middle of your screen. Um, and while you're starting to do that, ooh, fairy terrariums, yes, excellent idea. Or fairy gardens, yeah. While you're doing that, just a heads up that here in a moment, I'm going to be pulling up a screen where you're going to be able to download four different things. The first one is that aforementioned program idea sheet. Um, the next one is instructions for accessing the in online manual. So if you've never done that before, you can download those. Ah, sorry, you can download those instructions. <clears throat> the next one is that list of artwork that's no longer recommended for use. So be sure you check that out if you're planning on um, using your flash drive to develop your own posters and, and other items. And then the last thing is of course your LEU certificate. So make sure you definitely download that. Um, just a heads up that that document is locked for editing except for the area where you can type your name in. So don't be alarmed. Um, you won't be able to do anything to it but type your name into it. And then you can save it uh, to your own files or you can print it out, whatever you prefer to do. If you are watching this from the future, um, from the archived webinar page, Heads up that the program idea sheet, the online manual instructions, and the artwork no longer recommended list are available for download on the archive webinar page at the bottom of that page. The LEU certificate will not be available for download. Your library will need to produce that itself, and instructions for doing that are on the YouTube, um, the YouTube website. So I'm going to go next slide and just say, do we have any questions while you guys are continuing to type? Oh, I'm so thrilled to see so many people sharing their ideas. That's awesome. Thank you guys. 
I will take these ideas that you're suggesting and I will add them to the program idea sheet, just FYI. I see somebody typing, so I'm gonna go to the next slide. I will leave this up one more second, or a few more minutes, not one more second, and just say thank you one more time. There's my email address.